tonight and uh, tonight and probably next next week as well. Um, the Bible says in in Ephesians that Christ also loved the church, he gave himself for it, and for me that that says that that our church is important. It's an important part of who I am and, and, and what I do. And I don't know who and when they had the first church covenant and the first church statement of faith and the first church constitution and you know, all these different things. But the idea of a church covenant is, is a very scriptural thing. Whether it's written out or not, uh, we, we enter into a, a, a bond together as a body in Christ to, to serve the Lord together. It's a bit, it's a bit like a, a, a wedding, <laughs> it's a bit like a marriage. You know, uh, when you get married, you don't really know what it means when it says for better or for worse, do you? <laughs> you kind of think it'll all be the better. Uh, but you know, sometimes along comes the worse and, and, and we still need to be faithful, don't we? And it's the same with, with the church. And uh, as a church, we, we have a church covenant. It's just a, it's a brief statement of our commitment as a church. Uh, my definition of a church, now you can phrase it however you want, but it's a, a body of baptized believers who covenanted together to carry out Christ's ministry in the world. Yeah, it's, it's a group of Christians, saved, baptized people who've said, we want to serve the Lord together. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of confusion by using the general term, the church, too much. The church has this problem. Well, listen, it's not the church, it's churches. You know, it's not just a general thing. It's real people in real churches. And uh, we, we need to, th there is a time when we refer to the church in general, but, uh, you know, you can, re you can refer to the family and the car. It doesn't mean there's a universal family or a universal car. Uh, and I don't believe there's a universal church. And when we all gather together, it'll be a local church. Again, <laughs> you know, someday we'll all be in Christ together. But I want us just to look briefly at this. Uh, I've given you a copy of it there. I just want to read it paragraph by paragraph and just make a couple of comments and then look at uh, some scriptures. Uh, Having been led by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the public confession of our faith, having been immersed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, we do now in the presence of God in this assembly solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. Being part of a church, it's a, it's a commitment with requirements. Uh, the commitment is to Christ. It's not primarily to each other. It's first of all to Christ. One body in Christ. And the Bible requirements are salvation followed by baptism. It's not just baptism. It's salvation followed by baptism. Uh, Ephesians 5, like I mentioned, says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, we walk with Christ. But then paragraph 2 points out we walk together. In, in, uh, we purpose, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to attend its services regularly, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to give it a sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin, to give faithfully of time and talents in its activities, to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. So we walk together uh, to advance his cause. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, he, talks, he says in verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us. Uh, you know, we walk together. And remember, it's his body, it's his church. And what we're pointing out there in paragraph 2 is that we want to give our best because it's, it's for the Lord. And as we love him, we'll love his body, uh, the church. Later on in Ephesians 5, verse 21, he says, Submitting yourselves one to another, in the fear of God. I'll just add a comment here. We're living in a rebellious age. Maybe every age is. And uh, oftentimes people don't want to submit themselves to each other. People don't want to submit in marriage. People don't want to submit in churches and so on. Uh, but God calls us to humble ourselves. 
and uh, to unite together as Christians in local churches. Paragraph three. We also purpose to maintain family and private devotions, to train our children according to the word of God, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our conduct, to avoid all gossip, backbiting, and unrighteous anger, to abstain from the sale and use of tobacco and intoxicating drinks as a beverage, to refrain from all forms of activity which dishonor our Lord Jesus Christ, cause stumbling to a fellow believer, or hinder the winning of a soul to Christ, to be zealous in our efforts to advance the cause of Christ, our Savior, and to give him preeminence in all things. You know, no matter where we are, we're representing Christ. A church is an assembly, but listen, we're not always assembled. We're still a church, though, whether we're assembled or not. Um, a church isn't a building. It's a body of baptized believers who've covenanted together to carry out the Lord's work. We have a commitment to the Lord and to each other. So that means that what we do at home, what we do in private, uh, what we do at work, uh, how we raise our children, how we do our business, and so on, all of that is part of representing Christ. It's not just when we have our tie on and sitting in church. <laughs> uh, that's the easy part. Well, sometimes that's the easy part. Paragraph 4. We further purpose to encourage one another in the blessed hope of our Lord's return, to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to seek it without delay. And how we treat each other is very important. I think I mentioned John 13, 34 this morning when Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then he adds, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. You know, our relationship together as Christians is a big part of our testimony and our witness. To be a lovely church, we have to work at being lovely people. <laughs> um, 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he says, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. Now, loving each other is not just not treating each other badly. A lot of Christians feel like if they just ignore everybody else, they'll, they'll be right. <laughs> now, it's not ignoring everybody. It's loving everybody, loving other people in, in your church uh, to, do, to do something. Well, then the last paragraph, we moreover purpose that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church of like faith and order where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. In the event there is no such church, we will seek with the Lord's help to establish one. I've always believed that Christians don't just move from place to place. We move from church to church. And that we should be careful not to willingly move to a location that has no Bible-believing Baptist church unless we're willing to start one, unless we're intending uh, to start one. Uh, our, our church is an important part of who we are and uh, what we do as Christians. As uh, far as I can see in, in the Bible, after Pentecost, you never see a Christian who is not an active part member of a church. Uh, they, they leave their churches and go out and do business for the Lord, but they do it as a representative of their church. Paul and all, all these different ones. Let, let's go to Acts chapter 2 this evening. I just wanted us to, to have a quick look through our, our church covenant there. And then I wanted us to see the part of the Bible basis of it and then some of the dangers that we face in, in these things. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read just verse, starting in verse 41 down through the end of the chapter. This is right after Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost. They, they were meeting, and the, the Holy Spirit came, as Jesus had said, uh, upon them. And it says in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, 
and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with, the, with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We use the expression, the early church. The early church was basically the church at Jerusalem. It was a local church. It was, it was people. And uh, they had a membership. If you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 15, when they were gathered together, uh, it says that the number of names together were about 120. They had a list. <laughs> uh, they knew who was there. And uh, this was a church. They prayed together. They preached the gospel. As it says there in Acts chapter 1, they, verse 14, they all continued with one accord in prayer. Uh, Peter stood up and, and, and began to preach and, and to, to teach them. Uh, as we read in Acts chapter 2, they baptized and added to the church. You can't add to something unless it's there. You know, if you're adding to a, uh, putting something together, you're going to add something to it, you've got to have something there. And uh, they went then from there, preaching the word. And the Lord had to kind of get them going, but uh, like he'd said in Acts chapter 1, they began to go out from their church and to start other churches. Uh, and, and what a blessing it was to see as God's, God's word went out. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Uh, let me give you three things about churches tonight that uh, I think will, will be of help to you. Well, one is our goal, two is our function, and three is our methods. Now, our goal is very simple. You know what it is already. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. The reason we want to be a part of a church is for the glory of God. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, and verse 18, it says of Jesus, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Uh, our goal is to put Christ first. And He's the head of the church. And He said that He's the one who calls us uh, to assemble ourselves together and to faithfully uh, serve Him together. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, sometimes the Bible, occasionally the Bible will use the term church in general. But most of the time it's talking about specific churches. This, what I just read, Colossians 1.18, was written to the church at Colossae. Uh, our goal is to glorify the Lord uh, and to put Him first. Our function, I think, is most simply stated in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Some of you would have this memorized. Generally, we call it the Great Commission. God said, here's your function. Here's your work. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Uh, our function is basically there to make disciples and be disciples. I've said this many times. That it's the world that calls us Christians. God calls us to be disciples. And that's what he's saying there in verse 19. Uh, make disciples. Reach people for Christ. Uh, like he said in Acts 1.8, You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Listen, we can't do that as an individual. It's as a church that we do that. It's as churches that we reach out to the world. He wants us to make disciples. He wants us to be disciples. As we read there in Acts chapter 2 and, and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread, and in prayers, in Matthew, he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And the teaching and the preaching of God's word. Uh, God wants us to reach and to teach. He wants us to be disciples and make disciples. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Timothy was a, a young pastor that Paul was, was writing to, and uh, he says to him, 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on the, of the hands of the presbytery. 
He's saying, as a church, you need to be learning and growing and using the gifts that God has given you. The place we use our spiritual gifts is in our church. It's with each other. You don't use your spiritual gift on yourself. You use it on someone else. It's like we were talking about love this morning. Love always concerns someone else. If you're going to love, it's going to be someone else. Listen, God said nobody ever yet hated themselves. You love yourself enough. <laughs> the real problem with love is loving others. And it's the same here with our, with our church. You know, you can have a church of one, and you, man, you'll always have a unanimous decision, but uh, you need to have more than one. <laughs> you need to be a part of an assembly. And uh, our function is to be a part of, of a body. He has a lot to say about that in, in 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I won't read all of it, but a couple of verses. He says, now, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. I've had people sometimes say, well, where in the Bible does it ever say you have to be a church member? Well, it says you're part of a body, and if you're not a member, you're, I don't know, I guess you could be the church glasses, maybe, <laughs> something, I don't know, the church toupee. Uh, no, God says you to be a member. We're members in particular. Uh, earlier, he, he said the body is not one member, but many. Yeah, we're different. And yet, we, we are, in Christ, we unite to, to serve the Lord. Listen, my back is real glad that I have a hand when it itches. <laughs> It needs, you know, something different than itself. Uh, my eyes are, you know, are a very good function, but they can't tie my shoes. <laughs> you know, we're, we're different, and yet we serve together because we serve the Lord. Our function is to be disciples, to make disciples, and to function as a body. There's a lot of things we can do as a church, but if they don't fulfill our basic function, they're worthless. And we need to be careful. Now, there's a lot of things a church can do. There's a lot of good things. There's bad things as well. But we need to at least fulfill our basic function. Be disciples. Make disciples. Be a body in Christ. Now, he, God wants us to reach, teach, and, and fellowship. And quite frankly, some churches have lost their way. They've become just social clubs or, or different things. It'd be like a fishing club that never goes fishing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just has lost its function. Well, the third thing I want to mention is our methods. Some of our methods we don't get from the Bible. They're things that change. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure the Apostle Paul didn't use a computer or have a screen. But there's nothing wrong with having a computer and using a screen. We, we believe in computers, but we don't believe they'll save ourselves. <laughs> All right? Now, there's, there's methods we'll use that will change. Uh, churches didn't always have Sunday schools. Uh, some churches don't have, haven't had buildings. Some have had different kinds of buildings. Uh, we used to, we've had churches where we met in a school, and some people would say, oh, it doesn't feel like church when you meet in a school. Well, uh, we, we don't need to feel like a church. We need to be a church. Uh, not everybody has a van or buses. There was a time in the States when I was growing up that, man, churches would have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 buses, and, man, they'd bring in thousands of kids, and lots of people were saved by that method. We don't have to use that method. The Bible doesn't say go out and get 100 buses. Uh, different programs, having a youth group, um, meeting for prayer Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God tells us to pray. We, we must pray as a church. It doesn't have to be at any specific time. I, I don't think there's a, anything in the Bible that says that. Uh, these, these are all changing methods, things that we use to reach and teach people that aren't necessarily found in the Bible, but aren't against what the Bible is having us do. They're variables. Look, there are some unchanging methods. Now, you might disagree with me on some of those. You're, you're allowed. That's okay. Uh, local assemblies are to exist. We are to meet. Th that's a, an unchanging thing. You know, I've had people say, well, Pastor, we'll be with you in spirit. Listen, spirits are what are left when a body dies. <laughs> You need to be, I mean, I know what you mean. Sometimes you can't be there or whatever. But we need to be there in body and spirit. Um, a church must be visible. There must be an assembly. I believe they're to meet on the first day of the week to, uh, to remember and, and show his resurrection. That's not necessarily the only time we're, we're to meet. Uh, there is to be leadership. God spells out uh, that there's to be leadership in a church. Pastors and deacons. And they have specific qualifications. You can't just ignore those. Uh, I believe a church must have a sense of community, of oneness. Uh, that's an unchanging 
thing that, that God has given us, the, like we read in Acts, the fellowship and the prayer and bearing of burdens and so on. Uh, discipline must be taken seriously. Uh, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about when I say that, but you know, God tells us that there's a time when, as Christians, uh, if someone in our church is in known sin, in love, we're to go to them, and, and there's a process that he's given. Uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper must be practiced. There are groups that call themselves a church that don't have baptism or the Lord's Supper. I believe, scripturally, they're not a church. Um, there must be teaching and preaching. Uh, I've probably missed some, and you may disagree with some of, uh, that I've listed. But the main thing I want you to see here are, are the dangers. I'm giving you three things tonight. Um, our, our goal. If we forget our goal, we're going to miss the whole thing. There was a famous incident oh, before my time in the United States, playing gridiron. Guy ran the wrong way. Wrong way, Corrigan, or somebody. I can't remember his name. Listen, if you, don't, if you forget which goal is your goal, you're going to score for the other team. <laughs> All right? Uh, we don't want to forget our goal. Our goal is to glorify the Lord. It's not just about making you happy or me happy. It's about honoring the Lord. And, and as Christians, we don't want to forget our goal. Second danger is losing our function. As a church, we don't want to lose our function. Being disciples, making disciples, being a body of Christ. Uh, you know, if we lose our function, well, it's like we're reading in, in Corinthians, you know, we just, it's useless. And then thirdly, we don't want to confuse the changing and the unchanging methods. Now, there's people who have convictions about things they shouldn't have convictions about. You've got to do this. Well, the Bible doesn't say we've got to do that. If the Bible says we've got to do it, then we've got to do it. But uh, we need to be careful that we don't mix the changing and the unchanging, that we have uh, convictions where we, where we shouldn't and don't have convictions where we should. See, the Word of God needs to be our conviction. In fact, you could even take a church covenant and, and make it a problem if, if you wanted to. Anytime somebody starts pulling out the church constitution, you, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> well, pastor, in the constitution it says, <laughs> listen, the, the guide we go by is, is God's Word. And those other things are tools that we use uh, to help us. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 4 and, and verse 11. Uh, you know, Fellowship Baptist Church, that's, that's who we are. A, a body of Christ. It's you, it's me, but it's all about Jesus. That's the important thing. It's all about Jesus. And the questions that I would ask you tonight, one is, are you saved? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you been scripturally baptized? I talk to some people and say, oh, I was, I was baptized when I was a baby. Have you been scripturally baptized? See, to be baptized, you need to be a Christian. It needs to be by immersion. It needs to be by a scriptural church. Not just anybody in, in a swimming pool that happens to want to dunk you under some water. Now, my kids used to baptize each other all the time, you know. Uh, it didn't make it scriptural. Uh, have you been, are you faithful uh, to the Lord? You know, the Bible says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And this is all about our relationship uh, to the Lord. When, when we make a covenant, it's not just the words that we write down. It's the attitude of our heart. I want to glorify God. I want to function for him with other believers. And, and that means that I'm going to have to make some, I don't know what word to use here, allowances, some, some changes in my life so that we can work together in Christ. I'm going to have to forgive them. They're going to have to forgive me. They're going to have to overlook my faults. I'm going to have to overlook. I have agreements with other pastors. I tell them, I won't believe what they say about you if you won't believe what they say about me. <laughs> uh, you know, God wants us to work together as a church. And uh, it, it's a blessing. It'll also have some heartaches in there. But it, the blessing is that we can, we can honor the Lord and uh, do His work and we can use his word to reach people for him. I thought we'd uh, close just by singing this Revelation 4.11. Some of you will know it. Some of you won't. Uh, Thou art worthy, O Lord.